Geologist Marit Brommer and Anne Robertson Tate need no introduction in the geothermal world. Mm -mm. As head of International Geothermal Association, Marit has been a driving force for deploying geothermal power globally. Anne is on the board for Geothermal Rising, the largest geothermal association in the US, and happens to specialize in risk analysis and risk mitigation. They were both very excited about going head to head on the topic of environmental risks. And since these are some of the most frequently asked questions from our previous seminars, we think that you are really going to enjoy this fast paced game where we say whether these, ri these risks are overrated or underrated. To host this session is Baseload Capital's own CEO, Alexander Helling. So I just say like this, let the game begin. Thank you very much, Christina. And from me as well, very well, welcome to you, Anne, and to you, Marit. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you on this panel. Thanks very much, Alexander. Thank you. And we're, yes. we're soon going to start the, the game, but before that, I just want to say that the environmental issues, we need to take them very seriously. And we at Baseload are committed to tackling them responsibly. Uh, this means that we endeavor to mitigate, avoid or eliminate any issues in the projects that we develop. But in reality, there's always a compromise. There, the risk is always there. Uh, and we need to discuss it in an open and a transparent way to learn from each other. Uh, and I really have the two best possible panelists with me in order to do so. So, are you guys ready for to play a game? We're ready. Awesome. I am. <laughs> Good. I'm going to then dive in to the, one of the toughest geothermal risk questions that we have. So, the environmental risk related to CO2 emissions, is it overrated or underrated? We'll see. All right, so it's a, it's a tricky question. Uh, I don't see any signs, so maybe you can tell me what you voted. Marit, what did you vote for? I said uh, overrated. You said? And um, yeah, so, so, so the O for overrated, and it, it's not popping up. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> wait, 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 wait but just, just a second. So we're overrated at Marit and Anne, what would you say? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'd say, I'd say they're <clears throat> underrated and and if it's all right with you Marit, I'll I'll lump, jump into why I think they're underrated and it's a it's a pretty single argument geothermal reservoirs that are hosted in carbonate rocks they have high co2 emissions at levels that are similar to natural gas plants and even as much or greater than coal plants uh, some of the countries with these limestone reservoirs, they have no regulations to require the mitigation of the emissions. And uh, this, uh, this is totally inconsistent with our aspirations for geothermal, and it can seriously degrade our green image. Now, in binary plants that are supplied by pumped wells, they can operate in a way that keeps the CO2 in solution and re-inject it back into the reservoir. But there are limitations. Sometimes when the CO2 levels are so high, you have to operate under very high pressures to keep the gases in solution. This limits the production rate, which could make an otherwise attractive project non-economic. So that's my position, Marit. What do you think? Look, Anne, I buy your argument around carbonate reservoirs. Okay, I really do. But if you look worldwide and you mentioned the fossil fuel cycle emissions, they have, you know, between a thousand and fifteen hundred gram the kilowatt hours. Okay, if I look at my especially my friends coming from the volcanic reservoirs, they're even below the fifties. Meaning that, although I do buy your argument, okay, I do buy it, but if you really look globally, we're sort of in the range of 100 to 120 gram per kilowatt hour. That's 10% of the emissions that our friends from the fossil fuel uh, emit. Meaning that, although I do want to be net zero, and I want to be completely negative even on the zero, on, so basically the zero emissions, I do say this risk of CO2 emissions per power plant is overrated because we're already so low. Very good. Thank you very much, both of you. And uh, I suppose we also need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, right? So I totally agree with you, Anne, that on 
on certain fields or certain projects, we need to pay very close attention to the emissions that can come out from that project. All right, let's move on to the second question because we don't have that much time, unfortunately. So, second question here. The environmental risk related to valve stimulation, would you say overrated or underrated? I will have you just scream it out because we don't have the pop-up function working. So, you know, go ahead, Martin Anna. Overrated. Overrated. Good. We're, we're <laughs> on this one. <clears throat> so, and first, I'm just quickly going to ask you, can you please explain what well stimulation is for the people that are not in the geothermal field? Absolutely. And, and, and the most common one, especially in high temperature resources uh, and high temperature wells, is thermal stimulation. And that's a quick and uh, effective way of injecting cold water into a hot well, which leads to contraction of, of fracture phases and and uh, allows the the permeability to be recognized. And so this is this is something that almost everyone does when they complete a geothermal well. Now there's other methods too. Acidizing is also used, and it's handled with great care because it's a uh, strong acids in some case, hydrochloric, hydrofluoric. But this acid gets completely neutralized while it's doing its work in the reservoir, which is basically reacting with calcite in veins and fractures. It's a simple and effective process that has a very direct benefit, which is incremental improvement in productivity. Very good. Thank you so much for, for that. And I'll jump right to the third question because uh, we don't have that much time. So the third question, the environmental risk related to induced seismicity is that overrated or underrated? And I'll go with the same. So you just shout out underrated or overrated. Go ahead. I say underrated. We disagree. And I say overrated. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another <laughs> argument going. Fantastic. So Marit, I'll ask you to start elaborate. Yeah, no, I say this is underrated. The risk of induced seismicity is underrated. And I give you a few examples of <laughs> not only recent, but also in the past, where we see some, some serious seismic incidences causing impact to have projects stopped. And Basel is, of course, a very good example of 3.4, but we had Po Hung in South Korea and recently in the area around Strasbourg. So I think, look, look we can argue a lot about, you know, how and the whys and the ifs and the faulted reservoir and finding and de-risking that because that's what we need to do. Absolutely. But I'm very interested in understanding that this risk need to be taken as serious as we can because it basically stops projects from happening. Mm -hmm. And you want to, to comment as well? Yeah, I, I obviously I have a perspective from the United States where Geothermal power is mostly in the West, in places where the population density tends to be much lower than in Europe. People have experience with natural earthquakes. EGS systems are actively being developed in the Western U US. You'll hear from Fervo Energy a little bit later today. And we lower the risk of induced seismicity by limiting the injection pressure, avoiding active faults. Induced events are typically small and non-damaging in the minus two to say maybe one or magnitude one or two range. And um, so what I think is that this micro seismicity is really a nuisance more than a risk. It's often even not felt by people, even in more densely populated areas. So, and just personally, I've talked to hundreds of people about induced seismicity around geothermal projects. Everyone seems to like geothermal power and they want more and they're willing to accept in some induced seismicity. And I think both of us agree that the EGS resource is a large uh, resource. This requires stimulation of wells, which might lead to some micro seismicity, but uh, the, the magnitude of the resource is just too big to ignore. And we must be better at outreach to the public as was stated in the induced seismicity protocol that I co-authored some years ago. Very good. Yeah, and I agree. I agree there, and I think it is a mechanism to talk to people and get that emotional connect that we spoke about earlier as well at the at the seminar. So yes, to that. Absolutely. So educating both the communities, the companies surrounding it, and and the general population of what it what it means would would be a, a good way to go forward. 
and and you know the benefits of geothermal they appreciate when they understand it so this is this is an avenue towards acceptance very good thank you very much so let's go to the last question the environmental risk associated with land use is it overrated or underrated go ahead we're going to disagree again i, say, I think it's overrated, <laughs> underrated. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Marit, let's start with you. Oh, yay. Again, with my underrated, yes. <laughs> Look, I think, I think the risk of, of, of geothermal uh, to the land use and to our habitat preservation, I see beautiful pictures. I, I, do, I do acknowledge that I do see that. But I think my point here is why we underrate this risk is because we actually don't measure it according to a standardized way. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we cannot actually say globally that we're doing an amazing job being such a low footprint compared to the others or that we're into habitat restoration projects because we've done all that. So I think why I say underrated here is because I want us to measure and to be on track and to show that we are sustainable and that we have that standardization approach in our tool code, which we have at WZ 2020, because we're launching that standard uh, in October. But until that, I think it's hard to justify that you say, yeah, we don't have any environmental risk because we do have that and we need to be at par and beyond performance. Very good. Um, but, but Myrit, I mean, let's think about solar power. This is a very important renewable energy source, but it requires so much land uh, compared to geothermal for a fraction of the generation. And nothing can live underneath those expanses of solar arrays. But in geothermal, it's far more compatible with the environment and other uses of the lands. And uh, I'll just refer to two projects in Indonesia that I'm very familiar with. One is Wayang Windu, both are in Java. Wying Windu is in a, in a tea plantation, and so there's a, a constant uh, activity around the wells, the pipelines, everywhere. The tea is grown and harvested. And then at Salak, which is also in Java, this, this project is built in a protected forest with amazing stewardship of the region around the plants and only a tiny fraction of a huge green forest. If you look on a satellite image of that project, you'll see it. It's, it's covered in, in beautiful forest, natural forest. So I feel that they, you know, these, these two examples in Indonesia, they're cooperating with local people, they restore and protect the en environment. And, and this is why I'm hopeful. You know, there's also cases in Kenya at Okaria where animal migration corridors have been maintained just so that the animals can go from Lake Naivasha, which is a very important water source, up into the, or down into the National Park at Hell's Gate. So it's, there's lots of things like this. Thank you very much, Anne. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mort. I think we're, we're coming to, to a close. I, you know, I love this discussion and we could go on for this uh, for hours. And, uh, but just to summary, uh, would, if you would elaborate a little bit on the risk, because in each project we have a lot of different types of risk. Uh, but if you would elaborate on the risk of doing nothing, uh, Marit, what would you say then? Nothing in life is risk free, okay? And meaning that if we lose our appetite for risk, we can stop altogether with working towards a better planet and a healthier climate to live in. So in that sense, I am, I am, I am not against risk taking as a person, but I also think as a human being living in the world that we have today, we should basically say the risk of doing nothing is far worse than accepting that small amount of risk that we want to implement in order to have clean air for all of us out there and to phase out the fossils and to phase in the clean energy. Thank you very much, Marit. And Anne? I agree. I mean, I think we need everything we can get in the way of clean energy in this energy transformation. This is not going to be a transition. It's going to be a wholesale transformation. And I think your first speaker really spoke to that point. And this, you know, the geothermal piece is a very important one. There are no other sources of clean baseload power other than geothermal. Hydro is pretty much tapped out. We have to take some chances, develop some technologies, and accept some risk if we want a cleaner future. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Anne, for joining in. And thank you, Marit. And 
I think that when, when you think about it, risk is everywhere in every activity of life. So the important thing is to recognize the concerns and issues we are facing and address them in that context. No issue is overrated and it is appropriate that they are considered on a case by case basis. But as you both said, uh, the risk of doing nothing is still greater. So I would like to thank you both for attending the panel and then send it back to you, Christina.